Welcome to this week's episode of Being Human. I'm delighted to say my guest is Marcel Schwantes. He is the founder of Leadership from the Core. He's a speaker, he's an author, he's an executive coach. Joining us from Tennessee, remind me of the town. <laughs> Tell me. Yeah. Yeah, that would be Chattanooga. And, uh, and even for me, it's tough as a, as a U.S. based person because uh, I used to come. I came from Los Angeles, which is a lot easier to say. But uh, yeah, Chattanooga is a small um, city in the southeast part of the U.S. Yeah. In, the state, in the state of Tennessee, which is another state that you don't hear about often. You, you know, we know about New York and California, but Tennessee, where in the world is that? So here I am in, in the backwoods. Known for, your, for, for the whiskey, I suppose. And, oh, yeah. And amongst <laughs> other things that uh, Southerns like to do, but that's for another podcast. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Le so the, the leadership from the core, that, that, that pulled me in to begin with. Uh, yeah. Should we start there? What do you mean by that? Yeah. So when I was, uh, you know, as an executive coach, um, the best sessions that I have, uh, Richard, is uh, when a client gets these aha moments, right? These breakthroughs. And the only way to get breakthroughs is when you go deep within yourself, when you um, gain a kind of self-awareness. But the only way to get, that, get to that state is to go to the core of who you are as a person. So that's, um, you know, your uh, your values, um, leading from your character, from your integrity. And so I played around with the words and I found that, uh, you know, you got to get to the core of something to, you know, to, uh, get to the, the, the real, um, so in leadership is to, to lead from the core is to lead from the most authentic self. So okay. and when you peel back and peel back and peel back, you get to the heart of the person. So that's leadership from the core. Okay. Well, authentic self. So that might sound to some people like a kind of a strange thing. So what do we, what do we, what do we, what do you mean by authentic? Yeah. Yeah. I think that, uh, too many leaders fake it till they make it as the saying goes. And those best, most aspiring leaders aren't afraid of, um, you know, expressing who they truly are as a human being. So that's being your true authentic self. Yeah. And so who am I? Who, who, so where do I start with that? Right. So I can imagine something. So where do I start discovering who, who my true self is? Where, where, where do you, people who are in that position, they've got, got that question yeah. for you. Where, where do you start them? Um, yeah, that's a great question. An exploration of um, self-awareness, I think would be a good starting point. And I think that might be a, a self-awareness might be something that we'll, we'll be discussing throughout this conversation. Uh, you know, we, uh, tend to want to, uh, we have this, this thing called the imposter syndrome, right? And um, to, to uh, defeat the imposter syndrome that is uh, kind of residing in all of us, um, we have to not be afraid of, of being with our own emotions. <clears throat> so what does that mean? Well, sometimes you walk into a, uh, you know, a boardroom, a, 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 an important meeting with clients or even with your employees, you know, and they're looking at you as the leader. Um, and, and sometimes there's things that you want to share that is really hard to share, challenging situations, maybe, uh, you know, a change that, uh, that needs to be expressed. And so a leader that um, isn't afraid of doing that is really in touch with their feelings. They, they speak from, <clears throat> from their emotional intelligence, right? And so they have the mindset on, and they're mindful of speaking the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, they don't beat around the bush. They don't uh, sweep things under the rug. So if there's bad news to be told, they say it. Uh, and what we find is, and the research will back this up, is that those leaders that aren't afraid to just tell it like it is and, to, and say it tactfully uh, with, with respect and, uh, you know, and dignifying the human beings that you're speaking to, is those people, the trust level rises with their employees, um, you know, those that they are in charge of, <clears throat> because they're not afraid 
of uh, and being, you know, they're, they're not afraid of what uh, Kimberly Scott says, it's radical candor, right? But mm. she hook on it. So that's basically being transparent and saying the really tough things. Um, and I think that's what, what uh, makes, a, makes a really good leader as far as communication goes. So. Right. But it, it sounds to me like there's, there's two points here because cause I, can, I can speak with candor mm-hmm. uh, at some level about the reality of a situation without necessarily exposing what I'm feeling. So it sounds to me like you're talking about there's two, there's almost two levels of candor here, right? There's the candor about the facts, and then there's the candor of the of what's going on. In- right, right, yeah. We're we're talking about you know there's there's also the the term selective vulnerability. No, you don't have to share your deepest darkest secrets with uh, you know in a workplace setting. The point is that in in uh, in having candor, it's uh, it's is being in the moment where you're being emotionally present to your situation, to the situation or around you and being emotionally honest to uh, communicate the, the, the hard things. And uh, a lot of times uh, leaders uh, fear being in that space. It's scary. Uh, now we're talking, you know, we're delving into the whole soft skills arena um, that uh, is, uh, it, you cannot be a good leader without uh, mastering your soft skills so we've we've moved into sort of the soft skills economy now where trust and transparency are the new currencies uh tom peters the legendary author and thought leader uh says soft is the new hard uh and so that's what we're talking about here you have to really work on uh your self-leadership uh leading others and that's all soft skills arena stuff richard yeah Soft is the new heart. So, so that's okay. So, and that's, just, that, that's, I think, yeah, I've heard that once before and I think it's a very powerful thing to say. And for, for you then, right. So what, what have you found um, to be hard about developing your, your softness? Has, was there a moment in your journey with this where something started to click about this need to get to the core to, to talk us, talk us yeah. through that? Yeah, it was, you know, getting to the, the point where you're able to sit in a room and stare people in the face and say, this is what's really going on. Uh, the thing that holds you back is fear. And, uh, and fear is a terrible, um, uh, a terrible stumbling block to you developing your own leadership because fear, there's all kinds of other negative emotions attached with fear. There's shame. Um, so fear of failure, right? And uh, because you don't, because you think that you're not going to be, um, you're not going to be uh, pulling your weight and expressing too many emotions in the workplace. I mean, is it really appropriate to be that honest? Well, the worst case scenario is if you don't, and if you aren't that honest it makes things even worse because people will walk away wondering what was really going on. Was he really telling us the truth? People sense it, right? Yeah. Right. And and so now what happens is you have these little sidebar discussions in the windows, you have gossip spreading and then people are creating silos because they don't really know. They didn't know the, they didn't get the true picture of what is happening because the leader wasn't authentic with his true emotions. So, uh, so when you, um, when you master that ability and, uh, and you kill the fear inside your own head to say, I really have to just say what's really going on, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, then conversations are going to be so much more impactful, so much more productive, productive. And, uh, and your employees are, be, are going to start building trust in, in those relationships with the leader. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and when, do you have an example of when you first started playing with this? Can, can you recall a moment where you decided, right, I'm going to, I'm going to share this now. Oh my goodness. Um, so before I went out on my own, uh, I can share, I can share the worst case scenario. Um, my goodness, this is take, takes me back a few years when I was, um, spearheading talent management for, uh, a sister of companies, right under one ownership. And one of those companies uh, was uh, headed up by a, a CEO who was very, he was a brilliant visionary. 
uh, his creative abilities were off the charts, but he lacked in the soft skills area. It's very, very command and control, top down kind of a uh, autocratic leader. And, um, and so it, as a talent manager, my role was to look at the exit interview data to find out what are the trends here? Cause they were bleeding, um, talent. Uh, the turnover at one point was 60%. So I wanted to find out what in the world is going on. And so as I assessed the data and looked at the trends, reason number five was the CEO. And so I have to communicate to him, Hey, uh, you know, for us to stop, uh, stop uh, the the turnover drama that's going on it starts with you your reason number five and so i told him <clears throat> how do you think that conversation went <laughs> when you yeah when you're uh, you know talking to a an autocratic command and control person who does not have the self-awareness to understand that he is what he is part of the problem well um it didn't go too well he um uh, the the conversation backfired to the point where um, he uh, asked, not asked, he told me that he wanted the list of the people um, in that interview data report, that exit interview data report, which, by the way, if anybody in the world knows, that's privileged confidential information that's filed in the, an employee folder and stored in a vault somewhere that I don't even have access to, right? I'm the HR person here. So, uh, so yeah, he stared me straight in the face and says, I want the names of every person that, that, uh, you know, that, uh, blame me for, for their, their exit. <laughs> well, I, uh, walked out of the office and I was shaking in my boots, man, because uh, this guy, he meant it. And I, I'm, and if I, if I was, if I didn't do what he said, my job was going to be on the line. So I was going to be proof that here's another person that just quit being me that pointed back to him. So, uh, and it, and it did happen. Um, the next day I, uh, resigned. I sent in my letter of resignation because I could not, um, I could not, uh, you know, give him the, the, the interview report. Well, someone else actually got a hold of it. You got a hold of that because, um, you know, when fear is prevalent in the organization, even though I wasn't the one that did it, someone else had to, had to take the marching orders uh, out of fear to, um, you know, to um, uh, appease the, uh, the, the CEO. And so he got the interview uh, report with the names on it. So when I, when I got wind of that, uh, that true authentic self in me went and, and called every single one of those employees. Mm. Uh, because I felt that that was the right thing to do to let them know, hey, confidentiality has been breached. And I just wanted you to know. And I apologized on behalf of the organization, behalf of the CEO. As the person that did the exit interview, it fell on me at least uh, to, 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 to tell each one of those persons, listen, um, it's, uh, yeah, our confidence, the, the trust that we had in, in, in conducting that inter exit interview has been broken. So I want to take accountability for, um, for that on my end that I, I give you my word that this was a confidential um, interview. And, uh, and I explained that, uh, you know, the, uh, the CEO didn't take it too kindly that, uh, uh, that the turnover pointed back right at him. And so, I think that's when I began to, uh, to kind of investigate what true, uh, you know, authenticity as far as like tapping into your feelings and, and, and being in those moments that are extremely difficult. You think it was easy to call at each of those mm. people that gave me their word that I gave them their word, my word, uh, that share from the heart, what was really going on and how the work was impacting their health, their well being even, uh, you know, their family life, uh, because it was a fear induced stifling pressure cooker environment and it could not handle the CEO anymore. Uh, and so they had to make a change and I gave each of those per persons my word, this is confidential and I'm just going to use the data, um, to see if we can change things around here. And so, so that's when I realized, okay, 
<clears throat> and each of those people that I spoke with, uh, even though they were disappointed, it's, you know, they were obviously disappointed. Um, they each thanked me for being brutally honest about the fact that this happened. Um, and, uh, and so that's when I began to realize that, hey, that did something in me. Uh, that, you know, that triggered something in my heart. It's like that, you know, I, it made me feel good and it freed me up from any sort of guilt of having it just left it like that, where this CEO has, has the data and people's personal information of who gave the, who gave the data. And, uh, and so I cleaned up my side of the street and that took uh, a tremendous amount of, um, of, of, you know, um, of authenticity. And uh, so the long answer to your question, I guess, is, is that's, I think that's one of those moments where if uh, that I wanted to kind of dig deeper about, okay, well, you know, why is it that we aren't able to do this? And why wasn't that CEO able to sit back and go, wow, Marcel, this is alarming. I need yeah. to do something about my own leadership style. And, uh, and so that's what we're talking about here. And he, so he lacked the self-awareness and the, the authenticity to look inside, deep inside him um, to, uh, you know, to begin the work of change and, uh, and self-development and, you know, and self-inquiry. Yeah. And I think what I'm hearing in the, in the story is that you take that first step of being authentic and acting mm -hmm. with in, in integrity and you can't predict the results of that. And, and, and all of that unfolded. And yeah. yet through the act of doing it, ultimately you find it more freeing. That's what you said, right? And right. So, so it's, you, you're discovering this new way of, of being in the world. Yeah. And, you know, I went on my own and, uh, you know, started my own practice, et cetera. And by the way, as a as sort of an addendum to that story, um, that company folded not too long after I left. And, uh, and that's due in part to the leadership structure in place. Um, they were, you know, the, the antithesis of what we would call the authentic servant leader, right? Uh, hiding behind walls, um, not sharing information, uh, and, uh, and, you know, and, and just basically doing, telling people, do as I say, um, and, uh, you know, as they say, what flows from the top down, right? So, yeah. So if, if this guy was the, the antithesis of a, as if you just you introduced another idea that a servant leader, then, you know, what is a servant leader and, and why is it valuable to be a servant yeah. leader? Well, let's, let's backtrack a little bit to a little history. Uh, no, this will not be a history lesson, I promise, but we have to have context. Um, so, a few decades ago, back in 1970, a guy by the name of Robert Greenleaf uh, wrote a little essay called The Servant as Leader. Well, he arrived at the conclusion that the best leaders, and by the way, he, he worked at AT&T for a, uh, a couple of decades, and, uh, and, as that, and, and he was in the, uh, in the training uh, development uh, arena back in those days. And, uh, and as he conducted his surveys and his research and his interviews of what, what, uh, what made the best leaders, even then, we're talking about in the 1950s here, uh, everything pointed out to best leaders having mentoring skills. They were good coaches uh, and they uh, paved the way for other people's successes. And so they met the needs of others. This was an unheard of um, prospect back in you know in those days because we were still very much deep into the industrial age um, and so he wrote the essay in 1970 and then the researchers started to to delve into okay w w what are the key tenets of a of a of a servant leader well you know um, Greenleaf talked about quite a few of them uh, one of them being a listener a listener you know having good listening skills not just hearing words but being able to listen authentically to, to be able to translate that into action. So if somebody is expressing a concern, an idea, you act on that, uh, on, on your listening uh, through, by, by you know, creating uh, some 
avenues for change on behalf of that person or the organization. So la listening with action, right? Um, and, uh, and so the crux of servant leadership is really to make the person a better human being. Because when you do that, you make the person a better employee. And really good employees translate, translate to better performance and good business outcomes. And so, and so when, when I got wind of this, uh, this um, servant leadership philosophy, I started to do my own research. And then I partnered up with people, people in academia. And uh, one of those people that I partnered up with had done the research already. He, he had tested the servant leadership model that he developed with over 1,200 organizations. And so the, the key behaviors that I would call the building blocks of a servant leadership culture comes down to these six. Uh, one is, you, speaking of authenticity, here we go again. Great servant leaders display authenticity, right? Um, they're emotionally honest, they are transparent, and they are vulnerable. <clears throat> Number two is they value people. Again, these are our rather broad terms, but you value people by, you, by meeting their needs. You value people by uh, giving them feedback, by uh, respecting them. Um, and uh, providing for the needs. I think I mentioned that already. Number three is you share leadership, but that's counterintuitive because it means that uh, you no longer hold all the power. You want to release your power and allow others to make decisions as well. So what you're doing is you're pushing the authority down um, so that uh, people are taking ownership of their work. So that's sharing your leadership, right? That's number three. And I hope I remember the others. Number four is uh, provide leadership. So providing guidance. So that's setting, it, setting the expectations uh, and creating clear measures for results um, and uh, casting the vision and bringing people as co-creators of the vision. So it's not you're ramming your vision down people down people's throats. No, you are enrolling your team to design the vision with you and then carry it out. So that's provide leadership and then setting the expectations. If things change, you have to reset your expectations so that they have clear goals. So that's number four, which is provide leadership. And uh, I think that that one in particular, sorry to interrupt, is, yeah. is one where servant leadership tends to get sort of misinterpreted because what I'll often hear about servant leadership is, ah, oh, yeah, but you know, sometimes somebody just got to get on and lead, right? Sometimes somebody yeah. actually does need, and, and what you're saying is very clearly principle four here, is the servant leader does provide leadership guidance oh, expectations. People think that servant leadership is, uh, is, is a, 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 a soft way of leading and that it's doormat leadership, right? It's self, it's a, there's so many misconceptions about servant leadership. It's subservient leadership <laughs> and nothing could be further from the truth. These guys um, are, um, they demand excellence and they hold people accountable. It's just a higher form of leadership. Uh, but you have the servant part, which is the soft skills, the real soft skills area. And then you have the leadership part, which is the accountability part that, you know, that holds people to, uh, to uh, excellence, uh, to performance. Um, so the fifth one is, so we got so far reviewing display authenticity, value people, um, what did I say? Provide leadership and share leadership. Okay, we got two more. Uh, the fifth one is build community. So that's all about taking the values uh, off of the uh, nice plaque on the wall and making them live out those values within the hallways and within the walls of your organization. Um, and so, you know, those are the behaviors that say, this is how we belong and behave as a family inside these walls. Or even if you're in a remote company, that's fine too. You have these expectations of which, by which you hire and fire and promote people. Um, so that's how you build community. That's how you build a great culture and community cannot happen without personal relationships. And so the leader is out there getting to know people so that you're able to understand, oh, okay, these are his, his or her strengths, perhaps his or her weaknesses, and this is how I can make that person better. And you build community that way by, by engaging 
through relationships and converse, frequent conversations. So that's the fifth one. What's the sixth one, Richard? Let me see if I can remember. It's it's because I'm going off of research here. Um, the six uh, key behaviors of a of a servant leadership culture. Which one am I missing? Uh, we have display authenticity, value people, provide leadership, share leadership, build community. Uh, maybe I, it'll come back to me, but um, uh, later, uh, maybe you can ask me another question. Though I'll, I'll remember what that sixth one was. Yeah, and, and of those. Um... Of of those six, then, I guess which have you which of, of any of those have you personally found the most difficult to to develop, and and how have you um, de- how have you enhanced your ability in that area? I think the the hardest one. So when I do my trainings, I always leave, always leave display authenticity for last. I don't want right. to shock people into thinking that uh, you know all of a sudden they have to. Uh, uh, you know, express their emotions, God forbid. Um, so we usually go through all the others and then display authenticity is last because by that time, uh, people are, are more, more, uh, the, 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 it's a softer blow because display authenticity has to be, uh, ha- has to have some vulnerability attached to it. And, uh, and so that's the toughest one, as, as, as always, it's being vulnerable, not in a, you know, again, people misconstrue the word vulnerability as a weak, soft area of leadership, and it's not. Um, Jim Collins' book, Good to Great, you know, he talked about the, the humble leader. It's, there's two, th- two sides of a great leader in his research, right? You have fierce resolve, where you expect results and then you have humility and humility is the, is the ability to be vulnerable with other people. So, uh, so yeah, that's always the, the, the tough one. And, and, and so in that, in that context, can you remember a time when you, you, you first allowed yourself to be vulnerable, like where you, where you first started playing with this? Say that again, one more time. So a time when you, you first allowed yourself to be vulnerable. Like. Yeah, as a, as a leader myself, oh my goodness. Yeah, uh, yeah I think that uh, is, is in the role of a leader of people, there's always moments of vulnerability when uh, someone is not uh, pulling their, their weight as far as performance. Uh, is sitting down and, and having that kind of a tough love conversation as a servant leader. You're not, um, you're, you're not, um, you're, you're, you're not downplaying the fact that somebody's underperforming. That's when authenticity has to show up in full mm-hmm. force to sit down with that person and say, Hey, I uh, noticed your performance is, you know, you, you, uh, you're, you're not pulling up to, to speed here. What's going on? And in listening, perhaps that person is having a personal problem at home. Um, you know, and so you want to find out what, what's going on in, and, and if, and if it's, it's a it repeated pattern of behavior, then of course, some discipline has to take at, take place here. Um, because now you're talking about the doormat leader that doesn't pull his own way to say, Hey, you know, we have some expectations and you're not meeting those expectations. Um, and, uh, and so, right. yeah. so you have to, you have to have both, both sides, both sides. And first you start with understanding why, why is it that this person is underperforming and see if you can problem solve around that. But if it's a repeater pattern of behavior, then you gotta be that, that, that tough, tough leader that says, okay, you know what? Uh, we need to change some things here. If, that, is that, means, uh, if that means to terminate that person, so be it. And is that an area where you found yourself being most challenged is sitting down and having those, the, the, that t- those tough love moments? Nobody wants to have those conversations. Mm. Um, but I, I think that when you do, uh, and you know, neuroscience, I'm going to pull in a little bit of neuroscience here is you know, our brain is, is we have plasticity in our brain. The more we make something habitual, the better your chances of, of changing your behavior so that things become more the norm. Um, right. And so, and so if you are struggling with having those, 
emotionally honest conversations. Well, the hardest thing you'll ever do is to start having those conversations because over time they will get easier and easier to have because you're, you're changing your, your, um, you know, your, your brain uh, patterns, um, you know, to, in order to do that. So the behaviors become easier over time. Yeah. And, and I'm sort of trying to imagine a way in here because what I'm reminded of is when, you know, some time back I, I was in a 12 step group. Mm. Right. And, mm. and one of the things that we had to do at the start of this group was is to finish the sentence I feel. And, and actually you've got a range of potential sentences that you've got this you've got a sheet handed out of 20 feelings you could. And I remember when I first started, it, I found it, I found it so hard. I would just be like, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. And that's, <laughs> and that's all I could do. Right. And, and, yeah. Somebody was describing as it like pathologically English. Like I could, I could, that's all I could manage. And, and, and that was for me, what helped me start to break this, just, just to complete the sentence, you know, I feel sad. I feel angry, right. really simple, but in my own journey with vulnerability, and I, I still struggle because I can do that myself with my journal and maybe in an intimate setting, I can start to, to, to share. I feel doing it in front of groups for me is definitely where my edge is. Yeah. Um, but that was the start of me, I guess, learning to be more vulnerable. Do you have advice for people or your, your own experiences of starting to develop that, that practice, that muscle? No, I think that you nailed it is, uh, if you're, if you need to express something, yeah, it's good to say to start with, you know, I feel that this is going on, but because you don't put the blame on someone else or mm. a, a circumstance, this is something where you are being mindful in the moment um, of sharing. This is what's going on inside me because now that, that uh, disarms people from, you know, casting blame at each other. And well, he said, she said, no, it's the, no, it disarms people. So now they see the model being the leader, being vulnerable, that opens up other people to say, wow, I think it's safe here for me to do the same. And so that's what the leader, the leader is setting the conditions for his workplace, his or her workplace and culture to say, this is a safe environment. I'm expressing how I feel uh, about a certain situation that we need to work through together. And it's okay for you to do the same. <laughs> um, you know, so without yeah. reprimand or so the expectation has to be set by the leader for those conditions to take place for, for employees to feel psychologically safe to do that. And that's when you see creativity and innovation start to skyrocket because people now can, can, can use their brains and people now can share freely what, what, uh, what everyone wanted to say in the first place because that leader made it safe to do so. Okay. So and then that's, and I think that's what we're starting to touch into now is this, the, the question of why now, like why is, why, why is this become so important now to, to consider? Uh, and you just mentioned creativity and innovation. Is that, is that the hub of it that this, this movement towards this shift in, in leadership is being driven by that need or, or are there other factors? I think we have to back up a little bit. I think the innovation creativity is sort of the end point of, of, of the end result of, of what happens when uh, we work in a, an aspiring, collaborative, open, safe environment. But the reason to do it is because humans are designed at the core of their being. Um, they are designed so it, they are designed to, to experience positive, beha positive feelings, positive behaviors. Every one of us wants to get up in the morning and go, oh, I can't wait to be at work today. It's going to be an awesome day because we have a, a kick butt culture that respects each other, that values each other's opinions. And my leader is the one that sets the stage for that. So, so yeah, so we want, we want to foster an environment where positive emotions are, are being felt throughout an organization uh, because that when, when employees come into work, they feel good about themselves and good things happen. That translates, and that's, here's the business case for it. That translates to uh, better performance, higher productivity. Uh, you know, if you're in a, in a healthcare environment, you know, your nurses are going to probably feel more compassionate towards their patients. So patient satisfaction ratings go up. If you're in a manufacturing environment and uh, employees feel quote, the love 
by their leaders and it's a loving culture. Yes, I'm, I'm using the love word now because uh, I'm all about that. So uh, you'll see that, uh, you know, safety ratings go up. They're making fewer mistakes. And that's what, that's what positive feelings do to a person. It just, it's a, it's a mind blowing uh, uh, game changer that leads to competitive advantage when you have an organization where people belong and they feel safe uh, and they feel good about themselves, good business outcomes will come out of it. And right. it's, that's not just Marcel Schwant is saying that off the side of his mouth, that is proven over and over uh, through research. And, uh, you know, when you look at um, Fortune Magazine's annual uh, publication of the best uh, companies to work for, one third of those companies, 100 best companies to work for a list that comes out, one third of those companies um, through various assessments that I've seen or articles that I've, I've, I've read are servant leadership companies. Well, it's no wonder they end up in those lists because people love working for them. And, uh, and you know, it's a, they, they are cultures of trust. And when you can trust your leader, when you can trust your coworkers, your peers, that trans that that translates to really good good business outcomes yeah. so i'm gonna hop off my soapbox here <laughs> no i love it bring the bring the love bring the love marcel that's so important because your, your podcast is called love in action right all right yeah, yeah. um and i i think it's such a powerful word and of course yeah of course there's a taboo about talking about it but but why why shouldn't we have a right to feel loved at work yeah, yeah. and the reason that um that word gets the word gets uh, you know gets a bad reputation. There's no there's no place for love in a business setting. Come on, Marcel, You're, that's crazy talk. Well, we're not talking about the kind of love that's going to make HR people nervous walking the halls and wondering if, uh, <laughs> you know, if they have to call legal to come down because uh, you know, a couple of employees are expressing love in the wrong way. No, we're talking that there's no, nothing appropriate about love in the romantic sense or any other non-business term of the word. What I'm talking about here when I say love is, and that's why I call it love in action, is because the love that we're talking about of all the kinds. So if you go, if, if we have a, a history lesson of the word love from the Greek, right? From the Greek um, sense of the word, it's the agape love, not all of the others. So cross off arrows, cross off um, all the others, and just focus on agape love, because that's the one that every leader should be after. Uh, agape love is the love that says, I got your back, and I'm going to do everything in my power to make it and make this an environment for you to succeed in. So it's love back by action. It's a verb. It's not a feeling or emotion. Hmm. And that comes back to early in this conversation, you talked about uh, that in terms of listening for action, listening for the action mm -hmm. I'm going to take to make you, at least this is how I heard it, to make you a better a better person. That's what you said, right? So, right. And I have to attribute uh, Ken Blanchard, who um, I brought on the show, episode uh, two or three. And uh, Ken Blanchard said this, servant leadership is love in action. And so I ran with that. And I kind of borrowed that from Ken himself, who's, you know, as you know, has, has written a gazillion books on servant leadership. And he has no problems talking about the word love. Uh, in, in a business or leadership sense. Right. And would you say that's your vision then? Is it, is it for, for a world populated with, with businesses um, run on love? Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's not a unique, it's unique to me, but it's not a unique vision. I mean, the conscious capitalist movement is about love in action. Servant leadership movement is about love in action. Uh, even some of those B Corp organizations um, that do good in the world for profit, they're all about love in action. Uh, even if you don't have a, a, you know, if you sell widgets, um, you know, if you're in a financial services industry or something that doesn't directly impact a human being for, for good, you can still do good inside your own organization. Um, 
and to uh, to uh, raise the the awareness and the, the the well-being of your employees so to make it a great workplace environment for them and you do that through love and action yeah and, and the other thing i'm getting from what you said and this this is a couple of steps back now but when you talked about this the, the kind of conditions for people to feel like they've got this this love at work you, you singled out the leader right they, they need to feel like their the boss the person they identify as the, the senior individual is modeling this is is doing this and i think that's so important right that the people who for whatever reason get anointed into some form of you know quote leadership role they have a, sp- a special responsibility for this would you say yeah uh, and that's a uh, it's a good question that triggered a thought in me um we as, obviously as, would aspire to any executive listening on the call to um, champion this cause. As, you know, if you if you see the 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 possibilities of servant leader servant leadership culture in your organization, sure, it starts with you at the top, championing the cause, and then filtering down the 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 principles down, empowering your middle management, who will then empower their employees. Does it work that way? It, not, not always, because the, the people at the top may not have the vision. So if you're a middle manager on a call or even a, you know, a, a, uh, somebody that's heading up a, a, a 10 person team inside a, a, a ginormous organization, can you still be a servant leader? Servant leader, absolutely. The answer is yes. Even though you may not have, have it uh, as a, a strategy coming from the top down. And so I always tell those middle managers that may, may be in a stifling setting, you can start with your own team and, um, and bring the model and start, start seeing changes, start empowering people, start developing them, give them what they need, et cetera, et cetera. What I've seen is that those middle managers um, that become servant leaders, well, their numbers start to improve. So as the organization does those annual, you know, employee engagement, employee satisfaction surveys that go out, there's always that one department that's like all of a sudden the numbers are like shoot, st- shot straight up. Um, and so that takes notice. And then the executives start to under- wonder what's going on down there at, uh, you know, John Smith's uh, department. Let's find out. So that starts a conversation about why is it that John Smith's department is outperforming his peers? Well, that's one way to then make a case for servant leadership uh, organizational wide. So, yeah, yeah, I can really see that because because I, I can quite imagine that some people are maybe feeling a bit cynical, like, oh yeah, that might work in some other organization, never going to work in my company. But yeah, you've right. still got this ability to do something within your within your team with those around you. Yeah start to take these principles and as you say people will look over and like what's going on there maybe and maybe it starts to spread exactly yeah uh no i no, i like that and is there is there a point though where does that is there a limit to that you know is there ever a situation where you advise people okay you know the the, the environment you're describing is just you're just better off out i mean or, yeah. or do you think there's always a a, a place to, to start yeah that's that's this? good let's talk about that because uh you know people in the car are, go, are going uh, this is just kumbaya hold hands <laughs> around the campfire stuff it would never work in my organization yeah and you're right if your organization is focused on short-term results and you put pop profit over people because you're always looking at your quarterly numbers as the target this is never going to work for you. It takes a few seasons for a culture, any kind of culture to develop. It's not a flip of the switch. And so aspiring leaders listening that are saying ah, that, that, that could be potentially a, a good thing to happen here. Know that it's a long-term process, but that's what we, that's what we shoot for. We want our organizations to become sustainable, not the ones that like mine that had a 60% turnover, and you try to stop the bleeding all the time, right? Um, and so where it doesn't work is an organization that is only s- focused on the short-term, short-term gains, short-term results, okay? Certain leadership is not going to be too conducive to that kind of environment. Um, and, uh, and then the other, the other 
if you're if you're a moving target um, and you're in a co constant state of flux, maybe uh, you know you've you've had a, a current uh, merger and your culture is changing, et cetera, et cetera. When things settle down, the smoke clears. That's when you want to bring in the strategy for servant leadership. <clears throat> Not when it's in the state of crisis, when your organization organization is in a state of crisis, um, because in a state of crisis, you probably do want a little bit of that top-down person to march down the halls and say, "This this is how things have to be done around here." Um, you know, so you might want to filter out some bad apples before you bring in a certain leadership culture, because not everyone is going to buy into it. I've come into organizations as a consultant where the CEO immediately tells me, yeah, well, it's not going to work with this VP and this VP. Well, six months later, later, those two VPs were gone because they didn't buy into it. So they uh, yeah. understood, okay, I need, I need, I need to make a change. So that's what we're talking about. It's, uh, <clears throat> you know, it's going to, it's going to take a few seasons. There might be some turnover. Um, you might have to change some of your top leaders to buy into this vision and to champion the cause. Um, but in the long term, servant leadership is, is, is the best model I can think of for sustainability and long term results. Uh, and it's, that's going to benefit all your stakeholders over time. Right. Yeah. The things now are stable down the line. Right. So where you've got some stability and where there's a, a, a tolerance for some long-term thinking, yes. then you've potentially got an opening. There you go. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, can, I can understand that. And I can see that actually to some, that, that does work potentially at different levels because if you're in a long-running team, which isn't experiencing a lot of chaos, even if you haven't got support all the way up, you can still make some progress with this, this strategy, I could, yes. I could imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, I... I I, I love the fact we've talked about love, you know, because I've always thought that we should uh, we should be using that word more uh, in in our conversations, in work, in you know, organisations run on love. Just yeah, it doesn't have to be kumbaya. Let's 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 have it not be kumbaya. Let's have it just common sense. I mean, yeah. that for me would be nirvana with this. Well, that's of course. Why wouldn't we? Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, love, love is, uh, is, is the new competitive advantage. Uh, we, we have to remove our, uh, uh, this, our mentality, our psyche. We still live in, in, in a, a business world that is, uh, is very much still, I mean, we're, we're, we're seeing the relics of the industrial age still alive and well in, in business. And that's a shame because the world has changed and uh, employees' mindsets have changed. And now leadership has to um, catch up to what really what makes uh, for a positive work environment for your employees who will then turn that and make it a great positive environment for a, or a positive experience for your customers. So, you know, the research is out. You take care of your employees, they'll take care of their customers. It's as simple as that. Simple equation. Yeah. But we got to remove ourselves from the mindset that goes back a hundred years or longer. Yeah. Love them too. Love everyone, <laughs> including the yeah. customers. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, I get that. All right. So final question. I often like to ask my <clears throat> guests, Marcel, uh, this show after all is called being human. Uh, to you, what does it, what does it mean to be human? Oh boy. Um, I think that to me being human is putting others ahead of yourself and that's not denying your own needs. Uh, but I cannot lead and I cannot uh, uh, call myself a leader if I don't first take care of the needs of others. And, uh, and I think that's the number one thing we need to do as, as leaders um, is uh, just like a good father. I have a six year old. I have to take care of his needs for him to thrive and hopefully become a productive member of society when he joins the, the work world. Right. It is no different as a leader. Um, what does it mean to be to be human? Is to lead from a place where you look at people, people's needs first ahead of your own. And like I've been preaching throughout this conversation, is, uh, is to find out how to make someone better 
a better human being. Because when you have better human beings, you have better people, better workers, better work environments. So that's to me is what being a better human being is. Beautiful sentiment. sentiment. Uh, yes. I love it. Okay. So for people who want some more Marcel and more deeper understanding of servant leadership, there's the, the yeah, tell us, tell people where to find you. Uh, leadership from the core, C O R E.com leadership from the core.com is my website. Um, and you'll find everything there on my ink column. Uh, you can uh, join my email list. Uh, you'll see the Love in Action podcast on, on the website where I interview the world's luminaries about this very topic that we're talking about, how to love well in the workplace for business results. So that's where I would go. And feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn at Marcel Schwantes or Twitter at Marcel Schwantes. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time and taking time out of your uh, your Thanksgiving celebrations. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's, it's been, been a wonderful, con really energizing conversation. Yeah. Good. Yeah. I'm glad. I enjoy talking to you uh, across the pond. <laughs> yeah. It's just another weekend for us. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Thanks again. Really enjoyed it, Marcel. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. been a pleasure. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks. You